Hello, welcome everyone. My name is Matt Shepard, and I'll be your moderator for today's Team Gleason Center for Medicare Advocacy Town Hall. This session is brought to you as part of the joint Team Gleason Center for Medicare Advocacy, Medi excuse me, Medicare and Home Health Initiative to help people living with ALS understand Medicare, including the home health benefit, and to maximize access to coverage and care. The Center for Medicare Advocacy, as some of our audience know already, is a nonpartisan, nonprofit organization which, since its founding in 1986, has worked to obtain fair access to Medicare and quality health care for older people and people with disabilities through education, training, analytical research, advocacy, and legal assistance. The center is staffed by attorneys, advocates, nurses, and technical experts, all working for systemic change based on our daily experiences with the problems of real Medicare beneficiaries. Team Gleason's mission is to help provide individuals with neuromuscular diseases or injuries with leading edge technology, equipment, and services to create a global conversation about ALS, to ultimately find solutions and an end to the disease, and to raise public awareness toward ALS by providing and documenting extraordinary life adventures for individuals with muscular diseases or injuries. The Team Gleason CMA Medicare and Home Health Initiative includes three webinars and two prior town halls, all of which are available for viewing online at medicareadvocacy.org backslash webinars. And they are chock full of information from coverage basics to case studies. So if you haven't already, we urge you to check those out. They will answer a lot of questions. The Home Health Initiative also includes a dedicated email portal for those living with ALS to ask questions and share home health access stories. Uh, so be sure to share yours at homehealth at medicareadvocacy.org. Our experts today are probably familiar to those of you who've attended our prior town halls, Center for Medicare Advocacy Executive Director Judith Stein, Associate Director Kathleen Holt, and Attorney Madeline Korber. Uh, before I kick things over and let you see and hear them, though, I have to do our usual presentation housekeeping. If you can hear me, great. You use the information in the email you received after registering to successfully log into our webinar, and you've either dialed in by phone or you have good quality working speakers on your computer both of which are excellent. Uh, if you have used that telephone call in, we'll certainly be able to hear you when we take live questions. Uh, we're actually gonna begin today with some of the pre-submitted questions, and then we'll go to real-time questions and rotate back as needed. Uh, to ask a question live, please use the little picture of a hand at the left side of the control panel on your screen. As is often the case, we have quite a few registrants today, so for the bulk of the presentation, we're going to keep you folks muted, but you click that little hand and you let me know you want to jump in and I can unmute you. Uh, then at that point, if we find your audio isn't clear or it isn't working, or if you just get shy and prefer not to ask live, the control panel, as mentioned, always has a questions section for you to use. At any time during our presentation, we welcome you to type questions into that questions area, and I'll happily try to relay them to our presenters to the best of my abilities. Thank everyone who's attending today. Thanks again to Team Gleason, and I will now switch things over to Associate Director Kathleen Holt to get us going. Kathy, if you wouldn't mind taking control. Perfect. Are we on? Can you hear us? You are on. I can hear you. Great. Super. So, um, hi, everybody. Welcome to our town hall. Uh, we are thrilled to be here um, to share this with you. And it's your town hall, so we're hoping um, to have a lot of your participation. I just want to tell you what we're um, planning to do today. As Matt mentioned, uh, we have some uh, several dozen, actually, questions that were submitted prior to the town hall today. So just to shake it up a little bit and um, share our, our various um, expertise, we are going to shift off. So um, Madeline will have a question, Judy will have a question, and I'll have a question, and then we'll take a live question. Um, so we'll see how that goes and, um, and move forward from there uh, to see uh, how, how, we, how many of these questions we can get through. I will say that all of the questions uh, that we have um, have already pre-submitted questions have been answered in written form. So if we're not able to share them today, they will all be posted in our frequently asked questions section on the Gleason uh, Initiative website. Uh, I'm sorry, on the web page of our website. Um, but first, uh, what we wanted to do is talk a little bit about the proposed rules because we think that that's going to be really important for uh, people with ALS going forward to know 
um, some of the things that are happening that are being proposed mostly to be effective for next year. Um, so I'm going to start out with that. Um, and Madeline has been doing a deep dive into some of it as well. So as soon as I'm, I'm finished with my points that I want to raise, um, we'll have Madeline do it and then we'll go on with our questions. So um, again, the proposed rules that came out uh, last month and we are working to get them um, to get comments to respond to them by August 30th, the deadline for those comments. And so we've had a chance to take a, a pretty um, pretty good look at what's happening with them. And there are three points that I want to mention today uh, that I think it's really important to, um, to be aware of. Although I want to clarify, in our last town hall meeting, we talked about um, a, a provision in the proposed rules, which really isn't a proposed rule. It was a clarification of how uh, people with ALS can get um, coverage through the outlier provision of Medicare. And so we've had a lot of questions from people about when does it become effective and um, how, how do they um, access it? And I will say it's effective right now. So if you're looking for home care benefits, it's an option that's available to home health care providers to look at whether or not you qualify for the outlier status given the amount of care that you need. So, um, so please know that that's effective immediately. Um, one of the concerns we have about the outlier status is there is a cap on how many home health claims can be billed as outliers. And so um, currently the administration is at that 2.5% of all Medicare payment cap. Uh, and so again, the concern is how many more people can get care under that uh, particular provision. So uh, we will be again telling you to, to have your providers look at whether or not they can provide an outlier for you. Each individual home health agency can bill up to 10% of their business as outliers. So, so try to get an outlier uh, payment that will help you to get home health care. But that is, again, uh, effective now. So the other few things that I want to talk about, um, that one of the new proposed rules is that medical records of a home health agency may be used to support ongoing eligibility and recertification. However, if the doctor signs and dates the home health records, then the agency um, and the, the doctor's records must be used to, to substantiate eligibility for home health care. Um, I think it's important to know that when a record is, um, when the doctor signs the record, the doctor is essentially affirming what that record says. So be care make sure that your doctor is careful before the doctor signs a home health record. Otherwise, uh, if the home health agency, not saying that they would, but mm -hmm. if they, for instance, may be trying to discharge you from the home health care from their agency, um, who knows what they might put in the records. So it's really important um, that you make sure that your doctor reads what's in the medical record of the home health agency before the doctor signs on that. So that's one thing to look for. Um, another thing is there's a proposal to eliminate a regulatory requirement that when the physician is recertifying someone for home health care, um, that they provide an estimate of how much longer skilled services will be required. CMS is proposing to remove this requirement, which is a good thing. So, and, and the reason they want to remove it is because it's repetitive of other documentation in the file. So from now on going forward, if this proposed rule is accepted, then the doctor will no longer be required to say how much longer you will be needing home health care. Uh, a, a third thing is proposing to eliminate a regulatory requirement that the doctor when recertifying um, does, I'm sorry, I'm going to move on from that one because um, that, well, let me just say that the last one that I want to talk about is remote patient monitoring. Remote patient monitoring is when there is um, 
health data collected. So it sounds terrible. Remote patient monitoring sounds like somebody is, you know, spying on you. But um, despite the name, it's meant to be collecting uh, vital signs, health data, and transmitting that data uh, in real time for assessment and recommendation of the doctor to adjust the plan of care. So that's important. Uh, and we are going to be, be um, commenting on this to make sure that there is no intent to replace um, in-home services uh, in order to do the remote patient monitoring. So um, having said that, um, there's a lot more in the proposed rules that we are going to be commenting on. We are going to be sharing those in our alerts. Um, so please look for those. We would love to have your comments and sign on and your, um, your experiences to go into those comments as well. And now I'll pass it over to Maddie to talk about um, her portion of it. Thank you, Kathy. So another portion of the rule includes um, home infusion therapy services. And I've been reviewing this proposed rule and it, it isn't as um, broad as we were hoping when we first um, heard the title of this option. Really, it appears to be a supplement to the Part B DME benefit. Um, so uh, it isn't, It I, I think it makes more sense if I describe what it isn't first. So it isn't that now someone who is going to outpatient, um, receiving outpatient therapy, um, uh, um, excuse me, infusion therapy um, can now stay at home and someone will bring all the supplies to them. Um, it's required that the beneficiary has the DME supplies and has the medication. This is um, to ensure that the beneficiary continues to receive the therapy um, properly, that they're trained. Um, the DME benefit currently only includes a little bit of training and this is um, to expand the training uh, including remote monitoring, as Kathy mentioned, um, and other portions, um, and professional services, including nursing services. Um, the rule is very clear that it isn't intended to be a long-term benefit. Um, they're supposed to predict for how long the person um, should uh, take to learn how to provide these therapy, uh, infusion therapy to themselves, um, whether it be their first time learning or to supplement previous education. Um, so, we are, we are encouraged that this is a benefit increase, that now they want to ensure that people are receiving their infusion therapies at home. Um, however, it still only applies to the small portion of people who are able to qualify for the DME benefit. Um, and only a few select therapies are covered. Um, however, uh, if you receive a Medicare administrative contract or approval, then a beneficiary could receive the DME at home. It's, it's unclear since Radicava is, is this is a, um, uh, new ALS um, therapy that we received many questions on. Because it's still very new, um, it's encouraged that doctors have orders for the DME um, for this at-home uh, infusion therapy. However, under this proposed rule, it doesn't specifically discuss Radicava. Um, so if a beneficiary can receive a DME at home, um, then they'll be able to benefit from this new proposed rule. So we're hoping that it'll open the door to more. We're planning on commenting on this and how this is an improvement, but not as broad as we were hoping. Great, thank you. So why don't we move on to starting some questions? And Judy, you wanna start? Sure, uh, good to be with everyone today. And uh, what I'm gonna do is kick off uh, some of the questions that came into us between the last town hall and this one. Um, so this question, and we received, as Kathy indicated, many dozen. This question is, I was informed that in order for a home health agency to provide maintenance physical therapy, you have to find an agency that not only provides long-term care, but also accepts Medicare. Uh, this individual goes on to say, I contacted all the agencies on Medicare website, and none of the agencies said that they were set up to provide so-called long-term care. So as uh, some of you can imagine, this drives us all nuts because it's uh, completely unfair and unwarranted. Uh, because of the Jimmo versus Sibelius settlement, we should have all the providers knowing and those who make Medicare determinations once and for all that Medicare coverage is 
equally available for services, including physical therapy in particular, to maintain a person's condition or slow decline as it would be for improving a person's condition. So if by um, uh, this review, this research that this individual made, what she has discovered is that when she asked for uh, a home health agency to provide maintenance physical therapy, that they said they were not set up to provide so-called long-term care. So first, uh, strategically, uh, it's probably not best to start your phone call with a home health agency by saying, well, what I'm looking for is long-term care. That's really not a term of art under the Medicare law, and it may scare off some home health agencies from uh, assessing your condition and taking you or your, the person you're caring for in, an, in as a patient. Rather, I would suggest that you say that you have an order uh, from your doctor for skilled uh, physical therapy that is uh, going to be uh, geared to maintain your condition, if that's the case, or slow decline, if that's the case. Give maybe a little bit of details and uh, be uh, um, uh, familiar with the sections of the Medicare policy manual that will help support and counter any point the agency might um, think is, is true with regard to the fact that Medicare doesn't cover that. Uh, because Medicare does cover maintenance physical therapy uh, just as much as it covers uh, therapy to improve a person's condition. And so I want you to um, look on our website at the Medicare Benefit Policy Manual. The Home Health Chapter is Chapter 7. Uh, you can find it online, but you can also find it on our website. And if you look at Section 220.1.2 of Chapter 7, at the very top you'll notice that it um, clearly states that the question, as we've, uh, the, as we've been saying in all these presentations, should be whether skilled care, in this case a therapist, is the skilled um, professional, is necessary to make the uh, services safe, to be sure the services are safe and effective. And if that's the case, um, and the other qualifying criteria for home care are in order, then the person should be able to get uh, Medicare coverage. And hopefully if you can point to the sections in the Medicare policy manual including 20.1.2 and um, uh, also going on later you will find specific information regarding maintenance therapy uh, in that same chapter, then the agency may feel uh, assured that if they do take on uh, this care, they can cite to these sections in the manual and be paid for the care that you need. So uh, strategically, uh, don't go ahead and refer to this as long-term care, but rather that you need and have an order for uh, skilled physical therapy to maintain your condition or slow decline. Give a little bit of information about that and say that you've done some research and you find that it's definitely covered under the Medicare Home Care Chapter 7. Uh, so I hope that's helpful. Right. Now, what's next, Kathy? So, Matt, you want to take one? Sure. <laughs> um, I have a question from Peggy saying, what are the criteria for receiving home health care? I have ALS. Um, so, in order for someone to be qualified for uh, Medicare-covered home health care, um, and this applies for Medicare Advantage as well as traditional Medicare. Um, Medicare Advantage plans are required to cover um, at least as much as traditional. So, if you hear differently from a Medicare Advantage plan, they're incorrect. Um, so you have to be under the care of a physician who has a doctor's order for um, reasonable and necessary skilled services. So um, the beneficiary must need um, either intermittent skilled nursing, physical therapy, speech language pathology, or occupational therapy to continue services. Um, occupational therapy can't be to begin services, but it can be to continue on in the next plan of care. Um, it's also required that the beneficiary be homebound. And uh, this is a legal definition. It doesn't mean bed bound. This uh, doesn't mean that you aren't ever allowed to leave. Um, the criteria include that in order to leave the home, first you need um, the assistance of either a supportive device or um, someone else in order to leave the home. Um, or if neither of those, uh, that it be contraindicated by your doctor for you to leave. 
if you meet either one of those conditions, next is that it be a considerable, considerable and taxing effort to leave and that you have a normal inability to leave the home. So um, if you meet these criteria, you have the plan of care, then um, you will be able to receive home health coverage. The next steps um, after you have a doctor's order is to contact a home health agency, which if you go on medicare.gov, they have a tool called uh, Home Health Compare, where you can search for home health agencies for your zip code. And we recommend, especially for patients um, who who might require, well, regardless, um, <laughs> it's best that, that patients call as many of the home health agencies that they can um, explain, as, as Judy mentioned, say you have a doctor's order um, for this amount of care and see which agency might be able to offer the most care because it might differ. Some can only offer a few hours of home health, health aids while others could offer more. So that's where to start, Peggy. Okay, thanks, Maddie. And and I'll just reiterate what Matt said earlier, which is that we have um, done a lot of uh, information earlier on in the Gleason Initiative that's on our website. So we have three webinars uh, about about Medicare and the law and what's required, and also the last two town halls. So we would encourage you to use those resources. They are available to you, and we know that. People don't always need this information when we present it. So by having it in a recording form, um, when it becomes uh, ripe, if you will, for people to need this information, um, you can go back and review those um, materials as well. So I have a question from Sonia. I've cared for my husband for nine years, three years not able to work outside the home, constantly looking for home health workers to help. Why can't spouses get paid to care for loved ones with ALS? Our household suffers from stress of disease and financial need. Um, I have to say this is one of the, the main questions that we get from people, and it really is heartbreaking. Unfortunately, Medicare does not provide payment for spouses or families to care for their members, and, and this is, um, frankly, a bigger policy question that needs to be addressed. Um, from the standpoint of uh, you know, trying to get care as quickly as possible, uh, we think that the states are starting to step up, some of the states. There, um, there are more opportunities at the state level to help people to get um, their, to be able to work and to be able to get someone to care for their loved ones when they're in this situation. So for instance, um, the Kapuna Caregivers Act is a law in Hawaii. It was um, uh, it set into effect about a year ago. And the, this provision, provi well, it provides for up to $70 a day for a working family member um, to be able to help care for a loved one who is home and needs a caregiver. It also pays for transportation, personal care, respite, homemaker services. So there are some um, some organizations. The, the one that we work most closely with is called Caring Across Generations. They are a marvelous organization. It's a national coalition of 200 advocacy organizations, and they are working hard um, with the states to be able to come up with um, caregiver support. So um, that's, that's an option. Unfortunately, again, as I mentioned, Medicare does not um, provide for, for family caregivers. And on that note, um, <laughs> sorry. Uh, and Matt, you wanna um, share anything that you've gotten from? Yep, I, I, I'm encouraging people, please send your questions in. We only have a couple typed in and one, I think Judy and Maddie sort of addressed already. Uh, and then we have a couple very specific case type questions. Um, I'll reiterate the top level questions. I think it might be worth uh, uh, specifically stating once again what Maddie just said. Uh, and that's Lynn who says, our information's great, but they're having trouble finding a home care agency that takes Medicare. Uh, and they just needed to know how to go about doing that. Well, that's a challenge uh, increasingly uh, and very regrettably. Um, so as Madeline indicated there, if you go to medicare.gov and look up um, 
Medicare Home Care. Home Health Compare. Home Health Compare. You'll be able to find a list of home health agencies in your area by zip code that say they take Medicare patients. So first of all, uh, that's important because they should not be discriminating between what which Medicare patients they take. Um, so see if there is a home health agency on Medicare um, home care compare uh, in your zip code. And um, then uh, maybe start with the fact that you do have a doctor's order for care. Um, you need a certain amount of nursing care so they'll know that you have one of the services that would trigger uh, coverage uh, under the law. And maybe it's not so much that it would frighten them immediately to say, no, they don't want to provide that. And try and see if you can have a conversation with someone at the home health agency to get beyond a notion that they just don't want to cover, frankly, someone with um, intense needs. And then um, if you can find a home health agency that, that recognizes that it provides coverage to some home, some Medicare patients, uh, tell them what what is needed. And um, one of the things we're wondering about is whether you'll, we've been hearing more that home care agencies will say something like, well, we can provide a nurse and maybe some physical therapy, but very little physical uh, home health aids. And if we have, a, but we do have an affiliate or another organization with which we're affiliated that might be able to provide the home health aids. Um, in general, if that's the case, we'd like to know because we're wondering whether we can do something about the fact that uh, home health agencies that are certified to provide Medicare coverage are not, in fact, staffed up to provide all the services that Medicare will cover, but have some form of an affiliate to do so. Um, so kind of what I would suggest is be strategic about uh, trying to start a conversation with someone at a home health agency if you can find one that is certified uh, by starting with the lesser amount of care you need and then see whether having developed any kind of relationship with that person on the phone, you might be able to get at least some of the services covered by Medicare from a certified agency. Uh, Maddie, did you have anything to add to that? No, the best place to start is Home Health Compare and call as many as you can. It's, and then let us know well. if um, you find that even though agencies are on home, I keep getting it wrong, home care compare. So we know that they're Medicare certified, that none of them um, would would take on your care. Yeah, and, and I would say in the proposed rules, um, CMS says that 99% of all zip codes have at least one home health agency and 85% of uh, all zip codes have five or more home health agencies that serve that zip code. So if you go through all of the agencies that um, serve your zip code and can't access care um, or can't access the care that you need, um, please let us know. This is so important to our work in trying to make sure that CMS understands that there are access problems to home care. Um, so it's really, that's, that's a really critical piece. And it also is important for us to, to to come up with a, a maybe a better plan about how people should contact their federal representatives, their congressmen and their senators to say, look, um, you know, I qualify for this care and I can't get the benefit that I that I've paid for and, and I need. And on top of that, if you are in a Medicare Advantage plan, there is a regulation that says um, they're required to have plan adequacy. So if for some reason the reason that you're restricted is because um, these are agencies who aren't accepting this MA plan, you should contact your MA plan and, and inform them of that as well and our organization. Great. Okay, thanks. Judy, you want to take a question? Sure. So here's another question building on the issue of maintenance physical therapy. Um, this person says she uh, would like information regarding insurance coverage uh, for maintenance physical therapy and occupational therapy for patients with ALS since their needs are going to be ongoing. Also, what documentation is needed from therapists or the physician to support continuation of services? Um, so thank you for that, Sarah. 
Um, I'm assuming that by saying you want information regarding insurance coverage, you mean Medicare, but let me just say that that's what our expertise is. And if you want to know about um, a private insurance plan, do, uh, on the other hand, look at the uh, document that you should have been given that outlines the coverages under that particular insurance policy. They often, but not always, will mirror Medicare coverage. Uh, but you'll have to look at the individual private insurance um, uh, directory of coverages. With regard to Medicare, as I said earlier, and as is certainly true, maintenance physical therapy is covered as a home care benefit. There is no question about that. If it requires a skilled physical therapist or occupational therapist to provide the service, and that's defined simply as to ensure that that service is safe and effective. Uh, and the other qualifying criteria Maddie mentioned for home care uh, are in place. You have to be homebound and need a physician's order. Then um, maintenance physical therapy and occupational therapy are coverable services. Now, what documentation is needed from the therapist or um, from a doctor? The doctor has to have ordered the care. That's always going to be the case, that we need a doctor's order in what's known uh, in a, as a plan of care. He or she should state that, uh, uh, that uh, the physician is ordering physical therapy and or occupational therapy, how much, uh, how often, and for what purpose. So, for example, to physical therapy to maintain or slow decline of ability, uh, inability to ambulate or to teach how to um, uh, ambulate with a cane under uh, decreasing ambulation abilities and that uh, a physical therapist is necessary for this purpose, something to that effect. Uh, then uh, you have the doctor's order. You also need documentation that the service has in fact occurred and something about why, uh, what has been done. Um, if you look at the, again, the materials we've provided you on our website and in prior town, uh, town halls and webinars, you can find some details about the documentation that's required. You need to have under the, uh, to look under the, the Medicare home care manual that's in our, on our website and available on, online. Again, that's the Medicare Beneficiary uh, Policy Manual, Chapter 7 is the home health policy. If you look at Section 402.1.3.E, you'll see what is required to be in the clinical notes. And if you look at the federal regulations at uh, 42 Federal Regulations, Section 409.44, um, C2F, you'll see that it talks about what documentation is required uh, by the therapist uh, to show what has been provided and what's, um, uh, what response from the patient and what the plan is going forward. And in both instances, uh, with regard to the language in the manual and with regard to the language in the regulation, it, it should be more than just, you know, provided the therapy, be it OT, occupational therapy, or PT, physical therapy, uh, but some specificity as to what was provided, what the response was, and uh, what the next steps are expected to be, and that this is being done to, uh, particularly to, um, for what, what purpose, to maintain the use, maybe the OT is teaching someone how to use a fork differently, how to how to uh, stretch out the hand and arm in a way to be able to open the doors in the person's home uh, with more uh, regularity or to um, accept a new level of disability and manage with that uh, with some new devices. Those are the kinds of things that might you might find in documentation, but both the regulation and the manual shows what kind of documentation is needed and in general, uh, do recall that maintenance physical therapy to preserve to preserve or slow decline um, is covered absolutely as a Medicare covered service. And I think that hopefully will help with that. Good. And we can maybe we'll, and when we answer the questions in there in, in written form, uh, we'll put all those citations yeah, yeah. that Judy mentioned that if you in case you didn't catch them. <laughs> 
Maddie. Great. Um, I have a question from Adam. He says, we're struggling with the 35 hour per week cap on home health care. Are there additional resources available through Medicare or an appeals process to access additional coverage beyond the 35 hours? So to start, I want to unpack that a little bit to talk a little bit more about the coverage. Um, he mentions 35 hour per week cap on home health care. And it, it, for anyone who doesn't know, um, this 35 hours that uh, applies for the law applies to home health aides. So after you've qualified for home health aides and nursing nurse. combined, um, after you've qualified for home health care and you need um, some type of skilled service, uh, you also receive other supplemental services as well, such as home health aides, which we've discussed already, um, and social services, um, medical social services. And um, there isn't a 35 hour cap on the physical therapy, occupational therapy, speech therapy, um, but nursing and home health aides combined uh, can be up to 28 hours per week and in certain circumstances up to 35 hours per week. Um, as mentioned, sometimes it's difficult to find that a home health agency who can provide that amount of care. Um, and so that's why it's best to call as many as you possibly can and discuss your 28 hours or 35 hours, however large the doctor's order is for your home health aid and see who might be able to provide the most. Um, we have another question um, that was submitted about preference for, for home health aides coming into the home. And a lot of beneficiaries would prefer to have a home health aide who might come in the morning to help them get out of bed and come every day. Um, and unfortunately, in, in practice, uh, a lot of people like that and there aren't enough home health agencies and home health aides to supply all of that. So when discussing and coming up with a plan with the home health agency, it doesn't hurt to request um, certain hours, but there's no guarantee that you'll be able to have a home health aide come on your schedule. So sometimes you're, you're at the mercy of the home health agency, um, but, but we really recommend that you push back, push for as many hours as you can, um, and try to get on the best schedule that you can as well. Great. Uh, my question, so, um, hmm. Why will Medicare approve a power wheelchair, but not a way to transport it? Um, so durable medical equipment, like a wheelchair, um, is covered by Medicare primarily for use in the home. Um, there's a reason why Medicare's laws are written that way. Uh, but but um, um, if a person can use a wheelchair in the home, it doesn't mean that they can't take the wheelchair outside and use it in the world. It just means that they, um, that Medicare is assuming that a person is using it primarily in the home. Um, and it, it, it doesn't make a lot of sense if you have a wheelchair and you have no way to go to the doctor or to get out into the world if you don't have the proper transportation. Uh, again, unfortunately, Medicare has built its, uh, its rules around a certain, certain parameters and Hopefully there are other resources available to people to try to get that transportation. I, I know it's difficult. I've been in that position where it's really hard to find transportation sometimes uh, when you have, uh, you have a wheelchair. So anyway, that's the reason why Medicare covers wheelchairs, but not transportation, the transportation that takes people back and forth with wheelchairs. Okay, uh, Matt, do you have another question for us? Oh, not only do we have another question, we have somebody with a hand raised who might want to ask it live. Let, let's get crazy. <laughs> Robert, are you there live? Yeah, I'm, I'm here. Can you hear me That's now? Fantastic. We can actually hear you. It's very clear. Isn't technology wonderful? Anyway, <laughs> I was just wondering what prevents a home health agency from either indicating at the outset that although PT may be necessary, it doesn't require the skills of a physical therapist or whatever other kind of therapist we're talking about, or if, even if it does so initially after a brief training period saying, well, that's that's fine. The family can handle it now. Uh, you don't need any more skilled PT, maintenance or otherwise. Well, uh, this is Judy Robert. Let me try and respond. Uh, we hear that all too often, uh, that what is very often um, not true uh, that the skills of a physical therapist aren't required to provide the service. And in fact, as I think uh, we may have mentioned in one or two of these uh, presentations, we've I've, I've represented somebody whose uh, physician broke her um, arm by trying to stretch it. 
because he he wasn't a physical therapist and in that case the individual had ms and we need to respect how um, muscles are and aren't working um, given the underlying condition that people have the best thing i think um, that can be done is hopefully to have the physical therapist and the physician stick to their guns uh, that this is a skilled service, particularly in light of the overall condition of the individual, of the patient, which Medicare under the law requires to be taken into consideration. Um, and that it's simply not true that an unskilled person can do this service. Physical therapist hopefully would be able to indicate why, uh, what could be the consequence of a non-skilled person doing the service. And remember, skilled care is defined as sim simply making sure that the care is uh, safe and effective. Um, and it might not be safe for, for instance, stretching a limb that is rigid, uh, putting uh, uh, too much weight bearing on a limb that is not able to handle that amount of weight bearing. Uh, th those are the kinds of things that could be unsafe. And um, if someone is in good faith making that determination to say that a non-skilled person could provide the service, they should be able to be shown that that's not true. I don't see as much pushback as we'd like to see from the skilled folks. Um, they tend to to accept this and, and um, simply because they hear it so often. But it's also true that for decades we heard that maintenance therapy itself wasn't covered and that's not true. So hopefully get the doctor to continue the order, the physical therapist to indicate why her or his skills are necessary, what might be the consequence of not providing it through a skilled person. Also, remember that the uh, Medicare manual specifically states uh, that you're not supposed to take into consideration that uh, there is or isn't a family caregiver or other person available. Um, in fact, it's to be presumed that there isn't a caregiver available. I've seen denials where it's said that a caregiver could provide this care when there isn't even a caregiver in the home. So uh, I think, unfortunately, sometimes these statements are made um, and are simply not true. And we need the skilled professionals to put back, push back and say why they aren't true and, um, and, what, and look at the law that we've provided you in these um, sessions uh, to demonstrate that a care, also that a care, informal caregiver shouldn't be assumed to be in place and willing and able to provide the care. I hope that's helpful. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Uh, I would also add to that, Robert, that um, one of the things that we hear from beneficiaries is they'll call and they'll say, I spoke to a home health agency and they told me that they don't do maintenance therapy, um, which is an odd thing to say because they are, they are skilled to do the types of services uh, that, that people who need to have their um, functioning maintained or preserved or um, uh, to stop deterioration of uh, a function, the same as they would if they were helping someone to get better. So it's a, it's an odd statement. I think we think sometimes it's just an easy way for um, for 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 callers to to for the agencies to to end a call. Uh, but I think it's important for for everybody to know that maintenance therapy is just as um, people. Um, sorry, therapists are trained in maintenance therapy just as much as they are trained in um, therapy to, to improve a person's condition. Also, the other, the other thing I'd add is we are um, currently in conversation with uh, the Federal uh, Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, CMS. Uh, one of the things we've been uh, trying to stop is we replacing what used to be false statements like uh, you've plateaued so you can't get uh, skilled, don't need skilled therapy anymore, or um, it, it, it's maintenance only so it's not skilled care. Those things have been said to be unacceptable under the GIMO uh, case settlement that we brought. So now we don't, we've been saying, but we're starting to hear new words and language that seems to be just a gloss to essentially say the same thing. That is, we don't want to provide this care because it's maybe ongoing and it's for maintenance purposes. So 
this notion that it could be provided by family members or unskilled people is something we're hearing more of. If you are hearing that and it seems completely untrue given the circumstances that you or someone you know about are dealing with, and particularly if the doctor and or the therapist agrees, uh, do drop us a note. We'll bring these stories to the attention of the folks we're working with at CMS. Thank you. Ready, Thank you have you a question? All. Thanks, Robert. Uh, yes, actually, so this goes off of what we were discussing right here, which is from Kathy, said, um, I was a different Kathy. <laughs> <laughs> I was informed that in order for a home health agency to provide maintenance PT, you have to find an agency that not only provides long-term care, but also, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Jumped onto one. It's this one. One, not from Kathy, from Mary Ellen. <laughs> My apologies. One of the biggest issues is the disconnect between a home health agency and the therapists they contract with to provide the PT, OT, and the like therapies. The therapists tend to be the ones who say no improvement or other similar reasons. It's often the contracted staff who need education as well. Um, so, as Judy mentioned with Jimmo, we're we're attempting to educate physical therapists and providers um, that improvement isn't isn't the only uh, Medicare covered type of therapy, but that um, it's equally covered for maintenance care as well, um, and that it's also required though that providers be willing to almost take a chance on beneficiaries who need maintenance care. Um, we think that providers are less likely um, to provide some care because either there be financial reasons or because they're nervous that they're going to be audited and have some type of fraud alert and, and it, it just is too much of a hassle. Um, but we're trying to inform everyone that maintenance care is covered um, so that all the beneficiaries, the ones who are the neediest can still have access to the therapies um, as covered under the law. Great, thank you. Um, I, I'm just going to interrupt Judy going to the next question um, because I think it's important. We got an email from Juliet, mm -hmm. and Juliet was talking about how she shared with her doctor. Um, um, I'll just read this. Um, <laughs> He, like a lot of physicians, just believe what the home health agency tells him, this being the doctor, uh, believes what the home health agency tells him. Needless to say, this caused my hair to catch on fire. It's Juliet. I told him that everything he had been told by these agencies was incorrect, and I was going to come back and help him understand the Medicare home health benefits correctly, since the majority of his patients are elderly and have Medicare. I returned a month later with a binder of our alerts from the Center for Medicare Advocacy fact sheets, and I spent two hours with him explaining everything I had learned from our presentations, including maintenance therapy. Uh, two weeks ago, I was in his office to pick up a prescription when he stopped me in the hallway. Hey, Juliet, I have something to tell you. Remember that binder you left for me with the Medicare Home Health Info in it? I have been looking at it, and remember that you told me about maintenance therapy. I have a patient in assisted living facility who was recently discharged from home health PT. The agency told me she had exhausted her Medicare health benefits. Almost immediately, she began falling about every other day, running the risk of another break. I remembered what you had said, that there are no maximums on Medicare home health therapies as long as there's a need for skilled care. So I contacted the family agency and therapist and ordered maintenance PT. It was approved with no end date. So that's good news. Um, there are materials that we have and we hope people will use them and, uh, and hopefully agencies will listen. Yes, you'll find on our um, site, as uh, Kathy indicated, uh, not just the, rec the uh, recordings from the prior webinars and town halls, we also have, the, the as I indicated earlier, the, the manuals, uh, the, the home health manual section um, that you can refer to. It's usually, that's usually what home health agencies look to for as a practical matter for what they think is covered under Medicare. And then we have shorter and longer versions about uh, Medicare home care coverage. We have an infographic, we have fact sheets, uh, we have the GIMO settlement, we have the statement from CMS that's now on uh, cms.gov, their, their website. And we're hoping by the end of the month we will have another um, round of information coming out from CMS to reiterate that maintenance therapy and care to um, ensure that people uh, 
help them uh, maintain their condition or slow decline if it requires a skilled service that is covered under Medicare. So please do look on our site and uh, hopefully you'll find a lot of information there that you can print out and uh, show to your care providers or those you hope will provide care. So shall I answer another yes. question? Yes, okay. very question. good. Well, we'll move on to um, an, a homebound issue. Um, this is a, a question from an individual who um, lives in the cold clime of Wisconsin. And I think we heard from her during the winter when she indicated that uh, because her son, perhaps it's the same person, but I'll blend these two points in if it's not, uh, brought her to the movies during the winter that she was found to not be homebound and uh, therefore the agency cut off her home care. Uh, and she wonders whether uh, she says that she's really quite uh, pretty, pretty well able to get out three seasons of the year, but I'm homebound in winter. Can home health be justified according to the seasons? Well, it depends on how you look at that uh, at that question. Um, legal under the law, you aren't going to find something that says that uh, in winter people are homebound and in spring they're not. But the question is, as a practical matter, uh, is do you meet the legal qualifying cri criteria for being what's called confined to home um, when you are seeking home care? And if you are seeking Medicare home health care in um, uh, wintry, uh, icy uh, Wisconsin in uh, February, and at that time, uh, you are in fact unable to leave home without assistance of others or of a device, and it takes a taxing effort for you to leave home, and you in fact do not leave home, uh, but because of that, but for medical reasons or adult daycare or on rare occasions, like when your son comes and with grave difficulty gets, uh, helps you go to a movie, then you may well qualify as homebound during that period of time that you're seeking home care. Uh, so look at the qualifying definition of homebound, uh, known as confined to home, uh, under the law regulations and in the manual, you'll find it on our website as well. And um, then uh, if at the time you need home care services, you qualify, uh, then that can be the case. So it doesn't have to be all year round or um, all the time, but by the same token, the fact that you are able to get out of the house with assistance uh, and great taxing uh, effort and great difficulty to go to the movies on occasion with your son, uh, there's not, an, as Maddie indicated, what I call the no fun rule. You don't have to never leave the home, uh, just that it's not consistent, takes taxing effort and all the other things that we indicated meet the, the qualifying definition of homebound. So I hope that's helpful. And um, given that it's August, that may not be a problem right now. And perhaps you are able to uh, leave home without a taxing effort. I suspect like so many people living with ALS, um, you uh, do remarkable effort to uh, get about and manage with your um, your condition. Uh, but if you find that that's not possible uh, and you need assistance in making that case, let us know and perhaps we can help out. Great. Okay. I have a question here from Adam. Um, we've recently set up a special needs trust. What are the important things we need to know about using funds from the trust so we won't jeopardize Medicare benefits? Um, so there's a couple of things going on there, Adam. Um, Medicare benefits are public health insurance benefits, and so they're not income-producing assets. Um, if you receive Medicare, presumably this will save you from expending your private funds for services that are Medicare covered. So again, use of the funds, depending on how the special needs trust is uh, written, and we'd advise you to consult the drafter of any special needs trust for details of how that particular trust is structured. But usually um, special needs trusts are structured in such a way from a healthcare standpoint that you have your Medicare benefits and then the trust will be able to pay for deductibles, coinsurance, um, premiums, the, the extra payment that usually is on top of what Medicare covers. Nope. Okay. Matt, do you have another question for us? So many questions. Uh, we have another live hand. We could give that a shot. 
Let's see if Alyssa is with us. Alyssa? Alyssa? Okie dokie. As I mentioned earlier, sometimes that happens. Um, Alyssa, we'll have to get your question uh, by text. Um, we have, uh, as I said, several written in questions. Uh, maybe we can end with sort of a big picture. I'm sure we have a statement on this. Uh, Kathy is a little worried. Knowing we are approaching the baby boomer generation reaching Medicare age, if everyone is able to access these home health care benefits, as stated in these discussions, would it be a worry to predict that there is possibility for Medicare to run out of money for these services? No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Finish the question, Matt. That's it. That's the question. Oh. <laughs> in fact, I think uh, I think part of the, the reason we're running into the, the the questions that we're trying to answer today is because there's um, uh, a tipping of the balance uh, to worry about cost containment rather than meeting the promise that Medicare has had made to the people who qualify for the coverages and paid for Medicare during their working years. Um, there are many ways to save money in the Medicare program, and we would recommend uh, a number of them. For instance, negotiating drug prices for all of Medicare. Uh, for instance, not paying more for services uh, for enrollees in Medicare Advantage than for enrollees in traditional Medicare. Uh, there are uh, numerous ways to save real dollars for the Medicare program implementing fully the cost savings that were in place in the Affordable Care Act for Medicare. But um, failing to provide coverages for people for the services they need and that are in fact um, uh, covered under the law is not a good way to save money for Medicare. And in the end, um, ironically, it not only often causes uh, pain and suffering for the individuals involved, but may also cause them to need more expensive services if uh, someone goes without home care, which is one of the, of the lower uh, cost services, particularly since people are managing with so little home health aids right now, the, the least expensive service available, uh, they may end up needing uh, falling, they may end up going to the hospital, they may end up being unable to stay home at all and have to go to a nursing home. All that is more expensive. So for all those reasons, um, I, I would encourage all of us not to accept that, that uh, the, one of the ways to save the, uh, the program is to not use the program for the people who qualify for it uh, currently and need these services so much in order to have a relatively healthy and quality of life. Thank Amen. you. <laughs> um, I, I thought that might be a, a good <laughs> solid note to end on. Uh, so now if you guys don't mind, I'm going to take control of the screen for a moment. And I'm going to uh, do a couple concluding remarks uh, since we are at our limit here. Uh, I want to thank everybody who attended today and thank Kathy, Judy, and Madeline for another informative afternoon. And of course, our thanks to Team Gleason for their support of this initiative. Uh, this was our final town hall, but recordings, as I mentioned way back in the introduction, are available at www.medicareadvocacy.org backslash webinars. And we still do have our dedicated email portal for your stories and questions, homehealth at medicareadvocacy.org. Um, and also look for our 2018-2019 webinar schedule. Uh, it should be posted on that same page, medicareadvocacy.org backslash webinars uh, by the end of this week. So thank you to everyone for attending today. Uh, we will collect the unanswered questions as always, uh, add them to our pile O questions and get all those out to all of our attendees uh, throughout the series. Uh, thank you everyone and I will now end today's webinar. <laughs>